I'm Allie Jackson Jolly. I'm here with Ian Bremer, who, of course, is the CEO and founder of, U of Eurasia Group and also G Zero Media. He is also a noted political scientist. Ian, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Alice. Sure. My pleasure. Yeah. So uh, I'm excited to have you here because there's just a lot going on in the news right now around NATO. Um, and I felt who better to talk us through this than you. Of course, I'm talking about the fact that former President Trump turned candidate Trump was in South Carolina at a campaign rally this weekend. And during that rally, he made comments about the fact that if he were to become president, he would not support the nations, the Western nations, that did not fulfill their obligations, their financial obligations to NATO. So first, I just want to ask you, what do you make of this? Well, I mean, he said something a little more uh, incendiary than that. Uh, he said that um, those for those countries uh, that did not, uh, that refused uh, to pay for their own self-defense adequately, um, that he would tell the Russians to do whatever the hell they wanted. Um, and and you can imagine, I mean, you know, Trump has this incredible knack of of saying the kind of things that really, really incense his his opponents, his adversaries, um, and in this case, some allies, uh, the Europeans. Um, and they are panicking about it. And the NATO Secretary General and the European Council President predictably said that this is the kind of thing that gives comfort to Putin. It exactly, you know, strengthens him. And and I accept all of that. But of course, the media stopped there because the media is only looking to like put this in the headline box of oh, we found another incredible thing that we can embarrass Trump with. And, and there is another side of the story, of course, which is that the Europeans and indeed a majority of US allies in NATO um, continue to not live up to their stated commitments of defense expenditure for their piece of GDP. Um, they've been long committed to reaching a 2% target, which is well under what the Americans spend, and, and that's leaving aside the fact that the U.S. has a much bigger economy, but just the percentage of GDP. I mean, the Canadians, for example, spend 1.29% of GDP, which is roughly what they spent in the 90s, despite, despite long commitments to get to 2%. And so the question that should be asked, which is never asked, which is, well, if you're an ally of the United States and you consistently refuse to spend money on your own self-defense, should there be any consequences for that whatsoever? Any, any. Uh, because, I, I mean, I think the European and the Canadian perspective is, no, nope, you should just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, it does strike me that um, it is the fact that the United States has not taken this seriously. Um, and, you know, maybe the U.S. should say, this means you won't get the same level of intelligence. Or maybe it means that the U.S. won't do the same level of military exercises. Or maybe they won't station the same number of troops on your territory. Maybe maybe they won't um, you know, allow you to buy the same advanced, uh, you know, sort of military equipment so me, that the Americans yeah. produce. So let know? me ask you this. Why yeah. aren't those nations paying that? part of their obligation. Why aren't they paying that 2% of GDP or somewhere close to that? What do you think is going on? Well, some of them are. Uh, and the ones that are tend to be the ones that are frontline facing adversaries. So the Baltic states do. Tiny countries, but they're spending a lot uh, as a percentage of their GDP. And they're also spending a lot more as a percentage of the GDP in providing aid to the Ukrainians than the Americans are. The Polish government, same. And they've been taking huge numbers of Ukrainian refugees, in many cases in their homes, which the Americans are not, uh, and the Nordic countries. So what do those countries have in common? They're frontline states facing Russia. W what about the countries that aren't spending that money? The Germans, the Italians, the Spaniards, the Canadians? Well, the one thing they have in common is they're far away. But another thing they have in common is that the Americans haven't done anything about it. 
Um, and and I, I want to be clear. I don't think it's I mean, what because, you know, if you take Trump at face value, you know, you seem to be saying that literally if you don't pay two percent. So if if the Russians decide that they want to illegally annex a component of your territory, that the United States should not should be indifferent, mm -hmm. should not care. And I, I think that is an unreasonable position. I I even if that's just a bargaining tactic, that should be a private, that's an inside voice bargaining tactic. That's not an outside voice bargaining tactic. But it, it is true that the, the, the President Trump is much more comfortable with um, a an ally like Saudi Arabia than he is with an ally like the Germans, because the Germans, like they have the they support rule of law and democracy, and they have these common values with the Americans, and 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 they think that really means something. And and Trump is like, first of all, I don't really care about those values much to begin with. And even if I did, I wouldn't let you drive a harder bargain with me on the basis of this. I mean, Trump is like a real estate guy. For him, it's it's like a landlord's relationship with your tenant. Like, you don't care like if you like that tenant or you don't, if they don't pay their rent, they're going to be evicted, right? That That is his perspective. And the Saudis are like, okay, they may not be democratic. Um, they may be a dictatorship. Maybe they torture folks every once in a while, but they pay their bills. And in fact, they've got a really big checkbook. And, well, and let me ask you, let me stop yeah. you for a second and ask you yeah. this. Yeah. So, you know, you spoke a bit about semantics, right? And we've been yeah. through this before. We yeah. know that the way, to your point, that Trump talks, sorry, former President Trump talks, Correct. is that yeah. he, you know, makes these large statements that get people's attention. Yeah. Do you think in this case, it's dangerous, the kind of um, conversation he's having around you know, saying some of our allies or some of these Western nations that aren't paying their obligation are going to be, you know, let go to whatever Russia would like of them. Do you think that's dangerous? Or do you think, in all honesty, you know, six years, eight, seven years out of having been familiar with former President Trump as a political figure and politician, that this isn't as dangerous as some of the pundits would have it seem. Well, I'm sure it's not as dangerous as some of the pundits would have it seem because some of the pundits have their hair perpetually on fire. I mean, the dial is continually turned to 11. I mean, the sky is always falling. So sure, but that's not a, I don't think you meant that question because that, that's not a useful question. I think the question that you meant was the beginning of it, which is, is this really dangerous? And I, I would say it goes beyond unhelpful. It goes beyond unhelpful. Um, and, and the reason it goes beyond unhelpful is because we are not presently in peacetime. Uh, the, if he were saying this and there wasn't a war going on in Europe, I would I would say it's it's braggadocio. It's meant to drive headlines. But the allies will find a way to, like, talk him off the ledge find something that satisfies him, sh show Trump that he's the deal maker in chief. And, and, and he actually will get more money out of these guys, which he did to a degree the first time around, though not to the 2% level that he was demanding. But, but this time around, you know, you're, the backdrop is that Russia has invaded a sovereign country and the Europeans are spending on that. And the Americans are talking about maybe not. Um, and lives are being lost. And Trump has said he will end the war in Ukraine in a day. And this is the same Trump that pushed Zelensky very hard um, to open an investigation into Trump's political adversary, or else he wasn't going to send them weapon systems that they needed to defend themselves. I mean, in that context, uh, this will prove more of a threat to the basic functioning of NATO. Um, and I, I, I do think that the Europeans are panicking over this. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it, th this is something that makes 
that makes the Europeans feel like they cannot count on the United States long term, again, in a way that goes beyond posture. Um, so I, I do think that there is some damage. Now, I think that there's a reasonable point to be made that that Trump would that Trump is not just talking about I want them to pay two percent. I, I think that Trump really doesn't like NATO. Um, I, I think that he believes that NATO is um, a, a mugs game where the Americans just get taken advantage of. Uh, the U.S. is a very strong country in the Western Hemisphere with the Canadians, the Mexicans, integrated through USMCA, which was a trade deal that he upgraded, um, and two big bodies of water, and that the United States shouldn't have to spend all this money defending countries way, way over there, that they take advantage of it. Um, and so I, I think that if it were up to Trump, I doubt that it, if Trump becomes president uh, next year, I doubt he'll be okay with the, the ex-ante position of 2% GDP spend. I think he'd push for a lot more than that this time around. Um, and I also think that he would push more um, on uh, opening questions of whether the United States should be committed and under what conditions um, to defending an ally if there was an invasion. Um, and so I think there is a lot more at stake here. Look, uh, the, the, the big issue is that and uh, the analogy I'll give you is that if you are flying a plane at 40,000 feet and it's sunny and the weather's perfect, no wind, and, and you give the the controls suddenly to an untested and untrusted pilot for a few minutes, you will probably be just fine. Now, you take that same plane and you try to land it in a typhoon and you can't see the runway, then you give the controls to that untested, untrusted pilot. There's a good chance you're going to crash that plane. And, and I would argue that the plane's the same, NATO, uh, but the environment today is, the, is much closer to the second environment. And so we cannot, even if it's the same Trump, same pilot, uh, we should not be treating this environment as the same. Yeah, so now we are out of time. Um, it is going to be a really busy year, and I really look forward to continuing this conversation. Thanks so much for being here with us. My pleasure, Alice.